Welcome back to our course, Research on Corporate Transparency and its second discussion session. Today we have Alfred Wagenhofer as a guest. Alfred is from the University of Graz and a well-renowned scholar in the area of disclosure theory. Um, if you speak German, maybe you also know his two absolutely fabulous textbooks on accounting theory together with Ralf Ewert. But even for those of you do who don't speak German, uh, I was happy to hear that Alfred also contributes to a monograph uh, aimed at uh, uh, PhD students and on research methods. So um, I'm excited about that one. But now, without further ado, Alfred on Disclosure Theory. Alfred, over to you. Thanks very much for this nice introduction. And uh, I'm pretty excited to participate in this course uh, because I think this is a very innovative uh, way to, to teach and use uh, electronic Uh, instruments and helpful uh, sort of additional things uh, that we, we didn't use that much earlier on. So this is one of the benefits, I guess, of the pandemic. Uh, so uh, my, my task is uh, to uh, talk about disclosure uh, theory. Um, and uh, I, I'd like to, to start briefly once again, uh, why theory? So uh, you, I'm sure you all uh, visited the, the video uh, Joachim uh, did on why theory. And uh, I'd like to, to start with that uh, because that nicely leads over to uh, sort of an example I, I would like to, to share with you and discuss with you. Uh, so, um, I guess one, one key thing, uh, and I understand that most of you are more just more interested in doing uh, empirical research rather than theory. So I have to, to do a little bit advertising on, on theory, why it would be useful and why, why should it help even empirical people? Um, I mean, so it's not so much of a difference in a sense. I mean, it's econometrics rather than economic theory, and it's more mathematics and econometrics. So this is like uh, those are basic, basic, uh, very formal theory behind that statistics kind of things, right? So um, I'd like to to start with uh, how how do they uh, interrelate to, with each other and. Uh, so, so I think one key element, at, le at least for, for people who are doing analytical modeling, is like we, we'd like to see descriptive evidence. Um, so I understand that most people don't want to do descriptive stuff because, oh, it, this is like, uh, you know, not, not real research, what many people would say. Uh, but, but essentially, it's, it's, I, I think it's really interesting to, to have that as well. So um, empirical uh, research would, like, would, would inform theory. Uh, in theory building. So uh, there, is there are associations uh, which we might not have known before. And so they need to be understood. And so the, that's one reason why we would like to, to better understand what's going on. Uh, there might be new phenomena that trigger development of new theories. Uh, and there's also uh, something which theory cannot do. It's like uh, the economic significance of something. So there's an association or you, you, you do an, uh, a model, but, but you have no clue. Is it like a first order effect? Is it a second order effect? Is it like very small thing in, in, in a big uh, sort of world? Or what, what's the economic significance? So, and I, I think the sort of descriptive evidence is, is tremendously helpful in getting a sense of what, what would be like uh, something we had that really has has effect but the other thing is the empirical testing of theoretical predictions and this is like where theory informs empirical uh, stuff so uh, it generates explanations for very often mixed empirical evidence and I give an example later on uh, the paper I, I believe we talk about with, with litigation there is empirical evidence but it's it's really mixed so it goes goes either way and if you find associations in both ways and so uh, the idea would be to to try to get deeper and understand what's the what's possible reasons for this uh, mixed evidence Uh, it also helps uh, to get straight on causality. So obviously one can easily come up with associations by regressions and other stuff, but uh, essentially that the key element of understanding the world is causality, what drives what, and uh, theory exactly does that in a sense, but you will see theory, uh, particularly with the equilibrium notion, is not that easy to, to link with causality because things interact each other in both ways. Uh, but we, I, I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. Um, it can generate novel predictions that can be tested. 
and it can generate alternative hypotheses. And one thing about alternative hypotheses, which I don't see that much in empirical testing. So usually people come up with one story, uh, either theoretically minded or coming from psychology or other, play, uh, other, other areas. And then they say, oh, this is like my hypothesis. And now I come up with, with supporting evidence of, of that hypothesis. But it could be alternative hypotheses. And uh, I think theory can help distinguish between those because there might be different uh, beginnings states uh, to start with or big, uh, different other effects that uh, are exist besides that what one one has and so that would be a very useful way to uh, to start understanding what would be really the driver of what we we observe even though there might be a driver uh, that that's uh, pretty on, on, on the face of the thing right uh, so to, to characterize theory papers, and I'm sure you have started to, to, to browse at least, at least some of them uh, and get, get a sense of what, what, what they look like. So, so the idea being here is like it's a stylistic depiction of real phenomena, and it, it comes up with a particular situation and with clear uh, assumptions of what, what's, what's happening and also what, what's the decision setting, what's the behavior of people, what's their objectives and things like that. And it usually starts with a conjecture of what would be an economic trade-off. So whenever you, you do a model, essentially you have to have some sense of what, what, what drives what and what would we expect in some sense uh, from that. So this is not something that falls out of the, the analysis, but one has to really start with that because then you, you push and pursue it and try to figure out what, what's actually happening with, with this trade-off because it's very hard often to, to just understand what, uh, what, what goes on if things get a little bit more uh, complicated. And uh, it deliberately ignores other possible interactions. So this can be a, a, a problem because in reality there's so many other things, but on the other hand, it's a, it's a big chance to really get clear on one force. And then the question is, as I said before, whether it's a first order or a second order effect. So, so we don't know that exactly. Um, there's a clear sequence of events and interactions among players. And I, I show you a sort of the graph of, of, of the, the paper I, I briefly uh, talk about. Uh, and that puts real discipline on thinking and the arguments and what will be information uh, at that point in time when people make decisions, what will be conjectures in, on the other sense. Uh, so so who's, who's starting, who's doing what based on what set of information. And it also provides these insights into causal relationships because it, once you're, you're starting with, then, then you, you can't be a causal uh, effect of something else that comes later, in a sense. Uh, um, it, the, the, the beauty of that is, uh, so it consistently derives things and explains results. Uh, assumptions are all explicit. I mean, there are some kind of notions of where some, something is hidden, but it's, that's kind of standard stuff, but, but usually all major assumptions are explicit. So uh, it's verifiable. So once you believe the assumptions, and you say, oh, okay, that, that sounds like a good thing, uh, then you, you, you should believe the results. Uh, because they, they just really follow from, from those assumptions. So it's verifiable. There's nothing hidden layers in a sense, or there might be something else going on. It's, it's, it's just what, what's out there. And the, the mathematical language uh, provides rigor and precise reasoning. Because as I said, particularly with the uh, equilibrium notions, it's very, very hard to really get a, hand, get a sense of what would be the equilibrium uh, if, you, if you are not used to thinking these terms. And I, I give you an example in... in, in, in in, in, in the following. And it also provides conditions uh, that uh, why, why those results arise and what's, what's the reason for those results. And this is like the, the, the fancy thing in my sense that you know what you're doing. With empirical stuff, that's, you, you get more, more you know, real effects and, and all sorts of things, which is very nice and very innovative and, and, and uh, you know, useful. But, but on the other hand, you're, you're very often probably never really sure that, what you, that the story that you tell is really what's going on. It's just one possibility, maybe. You know, and, and here uh, in this formal setting, you, you can really say, oh, this is, given the setup, uh, this is what, what it does. Um, I borrowed from Jen and Shipper, they did the Foundation and Trends uh, paper on uh, sort of theory and, and challenges. And, 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 and the interesting thing I, that, that one can read there is what, what makes an interesting theory paper. And uh, so their view, generally speaking, is generate new insights and challenge our existing way of thinking, which is very broad. And I think this is very clear and, and insightful. 
Um, and now we have two different groups that may look at the theory paper. Uh, these are the peer theorists or the reviewers uh, and other readers. And uh, they have, to some extent, different views on what's an interesting theory paper than uh, empiricists. So for the peer theorists, uh, they really look at strategic interactions of players. So the more strategic interaction it's happening, the, the more interesting it, it becomes. Uh, endogeneity is kind of the key of everything you like endogeneity because you know you want to disentangle effects but you essentially see that things behave in a particular way that's that's unexplored or so uh, it provides novel insights from those interactions but it also and this is very often a sort of a really selling uh, point is uh, providing counterintuitive results and counterintuitive is uh, sort of counter a priori intuition so one whenever you come up with something you say oh that might be intuitive but once you learn from the model that something else can happen then it's obviously also intuitive to come up with this counter result right so it's counterintuitive only in at, 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 the, at the beginning and, and not not later on so for empirical people uh, they, they might or should probably read theory uh, because it rationalizes observed behavior and it shows the mechanism behind that. And that would, would also give sort of uh, additional sort of explanations and, and maybe, maybe even uh, things that one can test. It isolates the key ingredients of what drives uh, the results. Um, theory has just recently begun more to also think about uh, what would be an H naught hypothesis uh, against which to test something. So once you do like uh, earnings management studies, for example, then people have in mind uh, what would be not hypothesis, nothing happens essentially, right? But that's not, not the case. So you get biases also from economics and economic decisions, and they, they would generate a particular pattern. And that will be the basis to test against uh, sort of earnings management uh, hypotheses. So it's not, nothing happens. So very often you, you see H naught is like uh, sort of, you know, th th there's something going on. It would be very useful to have this clear idea of what, what would be um, the case there. It also helps select controls because you know what the mechanism should be, and then you can really control for other things that that are not affected by by this mechanism. And it also provides ideas for more specific predictions. And also, as I said before, I, I, I like this alternative explanation stuff. And there's very few papers in empirical uh, research that, that really do this and say, oh, that would be an alternative explanation. But we, we exclude that because for, for the following reason, right? And then you say, uh, given this alternative hypothesis, we, we would also have to find this one. And we don't find it in the data, right? Uh, and this, this is like something I, I really like because that's something in the, uh, anal analytical research can't do. It just can offer this explanation. But as I said, I mean, it's not clear whether this is the only one and whether there are other, other maybe more important ones. All right. Uh, so with, with that starting point about what's, um, uh, why, why would the theory, I, I briefly want to uh, go in the second part into voluntary disclosure models. And um, just to, to wrap up what um, you have seen in, in the videos uh, Joachim uh, was uh, putting on, on, the, on the website, which I think are very, very nicely uh, put uh, to, to give you sort of the sense of what's going on there. So in the voluntary disclosure setup, uh, we, we, we observed that firm, firms voluntarily disclose some information, others do not. So we get this kind of decision. Uh, that, that's behind that. And the theory tries to understand the economic drivers for disclosure. Why would voluntary disclosure behaviors uh, um, arise? Uh, and, and one can also uh, use it for assessing effects of disclosure regulation. And I, I know you, you will be talking in, about disclosure regulation in two weeks time, but essentially voluntary disclosure, uh, once you talk about regulation, most people don't see that there's a lot of voluntary disclosure up front. So one would really look at disclosure regulation only for, for, for the others essentially. And then you saw uh, and, and have seen this, these pieces on, on the website about unraveling, cheap talk signaling. Uh, there's also contracting explanations of uh, that, that would induce disclosure. Uh, so I don't want to go into those. Uh, but just ga ga go into one piece, piece uh, which is the unraveling. And this is just um, sort of a wrap up of uh, what you've, you've seen. 
So the simple setup is you have a sender, which is a firm or manager who makes the decision, uh, has private information, you have a receiver, this is usually investor for the capital market or another market, uh, product market. And uh, so, so in the capital market setup, uh, the sender uh, provides disclosure and info of information that's uh, uh, relevant for pricing and the receivers price the firm. So the key assumptions there, sender's private information, uh, and in this unraveling structure, uh, disclosure is truthful. So there's no way out of that. And there will be other models that uh, Anne uh, will be talking in two weeks time. Uh, so where you have bias disclosure. Uh, so, so the decision essentially is if you have the information, you either can report it or you are silent about that. So you hide, you hide the information, you just don't tell. Uh, the sender wants to maximize the market price. So this is like a, a, a typical uh, is sort of uh, assumption to, to start with. Uh, and the receiver is in a capital market, which in a competitive capital market, which means they hold rational expectations, uh, which is also the same as price protection. So they really fully understand that the whole setup uh, and they, they are not, um, so, if, uh, um, so, so, so for, for them it's easy to, to, to to just put, put in sort of an average and, and not being sort of fooled by, by disclosure, right? So that's the idea. And, and in the unraveling, uh, the unique result, uh, if you have this setup, it's full disclosure. And the reason is this extremely skeptical belief. So once you don't inform uh, the, the receiver, they assume the worst that can happen. And once they assume that it triggers disclosure, right? So this is what, what, what uh, Joachim uh, showed you with this nice little example with the dots, uh, I think 10 dots, right? Uh, with, with greens and reds and things like that. So you might wanna go back to that one. So uh, to give you sort of a brief uh, sort of example uh, about how to test those things. And I, I just recently saw, and uh, so, so Matthias, I think presenting uh, the paper about learning to disclose, maybe you've seen that before. It's, it's like a very nice setup. Uh, in the 1890s streetcar industry, uh, there was a, a new quarterly newspaper supplement uh, that would uh, post all the, the, the earnings from, from those companies, right? And that, that was just totally new for them. And so, so the question was, so once you can disclose and everybody sees the disclosure, would you actually disclose? That's what unraveling would tell you. And what they find actually is like in the first time people were hesitant. And so few of them disclosed, it was mostly good information, the high earnings kind of people, which you would expect, right? But nothing for the low ones. So they, they tried to hide, but essentially after two or three quarters, uh, that the whole thing got, went down. So if it didn't disclose, really expectation was skeptical, exactly what the model was saying. And they came up with this uh, kind of K-level thinking in here, which is a psychological kind of explanation that people learn from, from different rounds of disclosures. So once they learn and you do level one, you, that, that's exactly what, what Joachim told you, right? So you start with the average and then you see, oh, people, the, the good ones disclose. So, so I need to adjust my, 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 my expectation downwards if I don't observe disclosure. And then you, you get more people, level two, level three, and so on. And that's essentially what they, they came up with is like, oh, it works. It, it, at least it worked in, in, in this area. So, so I found this kind of a very neat example. And that's one of the benefits of doing empirical stuff. You, you, you dig out some data, which is exciting in itself, right? And then try to, to apply theory to, to understand things. Um, so, okay, with, with that, uh, I'd like to briefly go into uh, the uh, a current working paper uh, I've done with Stefan Schantl. And, um, uh, what, what I should tell you, it's a working paper, so it's not published. We haven't yet submitted it. It's brand new and we are still working on it. So there's uh, changes here and there. So, so we are still working on that and it's work in progress. Uh, but I, I thought it's, it was just too, too tempting for me to use it because uh, it's really exactly this unraveling stuff that, that's going on and really is a, a kind of straightforward uh, way of, of, of um, using and modifying uh, this whole thing and really look at into a kind of, I think, important issue. Uh, and this is uh, litigation. So once we do voluntary disclosure, then you may ask yourself, why would litigation be a problem anyway? Because it's voluntary, right? Uh, but uh, in, in, in reality, there is kind of like a, a, an in-between stuff, which is disclosure of material information by, by listed firms. Uh, in the US, it will be this rule 10b5. 
Um, and so if, if you have material information that, that you think, and I'm pretty sure that it has a price effect, then you have to disclose it, even if it doesn't show up in disclosure requirements generally. So this is a very general requirement and uh, people litigate on that. So if you have, particularly if you have bad news, and you, you didn't tell them and later comes comes up, uh, then people start thinking, hey, they, they shouldn't have had this information before. So so let me, so, so maybe I paid uh, too high a price for, for the shares that I bought me in between. And then so let me litigate and, and see whether I can get compensation for my uh, presumed uh, damage. And uh, there's a lot of uh, empirical work uh, that looks at the relationship between uh, disclosure and litigation risk. And here is kind of sort of a, a, a very, very broad and um, uh, overview of uh, what, what's happening. And this is like an example where we have very much mixed empirical evidence. So more litigation is associated with more disclosure. And the, the kind of um, idea behind that will be a preemption effect which means that firms uh, know they have uh, bad information. And so they try to disclose very early and warn investors. So they can't be saying, oh, you, you knew that before, you know, because you just got it. And then you say, oh, okay, let, let me disclose that. So uh, you get more disclosure, a particular of bad news, uh, given you have uh, this, this potential of litigation risk. Uh, the other uh, idea is more litigation risk is, is associated with less disclosure. In the idea it would be called like a chilling effect, uh, which means that uh, once you, you do really forward looking information, totally voluntary, not, not really required by, by this rule 10b5, for example, uh, then you, you try, you probably won't do it because uh, what, what's happening here is a different story that once the actuals come out later and you have sort of uh, just an estimate upfront, it might be wrong, right? And it, it will usually be wrong. Okay, and then the question is, uh, is it like uh, it was imprecise information and uh, this just happened uh, and this is the risk uh, that that's out there or was it like uh, earnings management in this regard right and if it was earning and, and if, if it was earnings management you you would like to you, you would sue uh, and the court may may err and may not, not really figure out whether it was like just luck or, or bad luck or and, or it was like earnings management and then you you, you provide less forward looking information. So we've seen a lot of empirical uh, papers on, on, on all those sorts of things. And there's one paper by Field and others, and they recognize explicitly the endogeneity between disclosure and litigation. And this is exactly what, what the model is essentially about. So it's not, not easy to, to say uh, litigation risk drives disclosure or disclosure avoids litigation risk. So, so it goes in both cases, it goes both ways essentially, and they, they actually do a simultaneous uh, equations uh, stuff, uh, trying to get a sense, you know, get, get hold of this endogeneity, which, which I, I enjoyed uh, reading uh, very much. Um, but that's kind of like a typical motivation for a theory paper, right? Trying to say, oh, th there's so much going on, and let, let me be clear on what's going on here, and maybe we come up with something. And there have been very few papers about litigation in this area. So there are, there are basically two, maybe another one, but but two, two that they will be close to, uh, Truman and, and, and Ron Dye, but they did sort of ex very special cases. And so we, we just extended that in a sense. Okay, so the basic model uh, is like uh, this, this is the die stuff, right? And this is what, what Joachim uh, had, had in the slides and in his video. So essentially you have a particular probability that uh, the entrepreneur learns uh, the information and then makes the decision to disclose or not disclose. So if there is disclosure, then it's easy to come up with a price because that's price informative, right? And it's truthful as we know by assumption. So the, the interesting thing is if the um, uh, entrepreneur withholds the information because it could be that he doesn't know the information, right? So you got these two together and you got a price uh, that's only dependent on the fact that there is no disclosure because you would have expected disclosure at some events. So if there's no disclosure, this is actually informative. And this gives you this unraveling stuff. But, sin, but, but, but since the, the entrepreneur had the chance not to learn the, the information, so you, you don't go to, to zero, right? So you don't go to the burst, but, but you have to come up with sort of a, a weighted average of, of, of sort of bad news and sort of neutral news, essentially. 
So this is like uh, what the dye model do, uh, is, and this is what you saw in, in the slides. So what we do uh, in this extension is we, we really look at uh, litigation uh, based on that. So you, you would never do lit have litigation if you disclosed. So if there's disclosure, it's fine, right? So the problem is if there's non-disclosure, uh, then uh, we need a trigger. Uh, why would you uh, have a reason to sue uh, so you need some evidence in court. And so we just assume uh, the, the shells observe uh, some X. Okay, so they, they observe the X uh, exposed with a particular probability and with another probability they don't observe anything. And so if they don't observe anything, uh, there's no, this, no litigation because there's no case. So you can't go before court. Oh, maybe, I don't know, but you know. Uh, so, so you observe, so, so shareholders observe the X and, and then decide uh, whether to litigate. And the problem with litigation, it's, it's really costly. So there's a cost. Uh, so you need to trade off uh, the potential benefit, uh, the expected compensation. And the compensation usually, particularly in the US market, uh, but also in many other markets is like the damage. You, you paid an inflated price. So what would have been the price uh, you you could have you 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 had you had to pay if there was disclosure, right? So you got to the difference between the non-disclosure price and what would have been the price uh, once you 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 had known the X, right? And uh, that that determines the um, compensation, uh, and uh, and that's what you what you look at. And once you litigate, you have you you receive this one or nothing because uh, the court figure have to, has to figure out whether uh, the, the firm actually knew the information or not. So this is an inference going on there, right? So this is what, what, what the structure of the game is. And to just briefly uh, get into intuition. Hmm. Oops. Um, so uh, is litigation a good thing? Uh, so uh, there, there the two extremes. So extreme number one would be, uh, suppose it's extremely costly to litigate, right? Then obviously you, you never litigate and then we are back into the die model. Okay, so this is like the standard stuff. So the other extreme is you have costless litigation, then you would always litigate. So you would say, oh, then it doesn't matter uh, because I get the damage compensation for the X, so, so it doesn't. I, I don't care. But actually, that's not the case because you have the, only the probability land that you get this information. So there's always kind of discount uh, that's going on. So, uh, but litigation is kind of an insurance policy for for the investors, right? So that's that's the the base idea. So, and the, the question is what happens in between and um, litigation is uh, strategic, depends on shareholders' expectations. And you get two pieces of information. Uh, you you want to have, uh, was information withheld? And, and then you, with the, then when you ever saw the X, uh, you see what will be the compensation, all right? You, you can see that. And the expectation is shaped by disclosure strategy and that also depends on the market price. So this is what's what's going on. The firm has to take that into account. And, and here is where it, it starts being difficult to just sit down and think, hey, what's going to happen if I change this or that, right? So what does the formal analysis do? Uh, it uses typically in this kind of games backward induction. So you start from the last stage at T3 so and, and move forward because uh, you get rid of uh, variables and you feed in the expectations of what, what's going on. So we start with the investor litigation decision. And as I said before, uh, this is kind of simple trade off. How, how, how likely is it that the firm withheld information times the compensation uh, that I get minus the litigation cost? And so you, you, the, the, the strategy given, given this is you litigate if the information was really bad so below some certain threshold, all right? Investors pricing decision, that's one step uh, before that. Uh, if it's disclosure, that's fine, so you get the X. For non-disclosure, uh, one has to conjecture what's the disclosure strategy is. And we assume that uh, the entrepreneur uh, withholds bad information. So we have this tau, and it's actually a tau hat. As you notice, there's this tau hat, uh, which means what? Hat uh, usually it, uh, indicates conjectures. So you don't know this strategy. I mean, you conjecture the strategy and you work uh, with your uh, decision, you work against the strategy essentially. So uh, if, if there's no disclosure uh, and you assume this conjecture tau, uh, then this is like what, what the price will be plus the expected compensation from litigation, right? 
So what does the entrepreneur do given that? Uh, so that the really important thing is this P&D, right? So what happens if I don't disclose? So uh, as, as in the in the run, in, in the die paper, uh, you disclose all favorable information larger than this uh, threshold. Uh, but here you again have this hat because you don't know what the what the others do. You have conjectures about those, right? And so you say, oh, okay, I disclose all good good stuff, but I don't disclose the bad stuff, uh, which uh, goes in line with these expectations, right? And um, and uh, then we look at the Bayesian, Bayesian equilibrium, uh, which means all the conjectures in equilibrium must be fulfilled so that the tau hat must be the tau, the p hat uh, must be the p, and things like that. And then you plug those things in, and then you, you end up with an equilibrium, all right? So to give you sort of just a quick uh, view of the, of the results, um, so the characteristic from disclosure games is uh, satisfied because you always disclose the good stuff. So the question is how much of the bad stuff you want to disclose, all right? And that really depends on litigation risk. So the legal cost of the shareholders who sue, if this is very high, they don't sue that often and uh, you get a different uh, sort of expectation than, than otherwise. And here's a quick example how that would look like. So if there is no no litigation that would start from here, you end up with something which is the, the die stuff, right? So you, you go down with your expectations uh, with the non-disclosure price, uh, but there's no litigation, right? So this is like the standard stuff. Uh, this is the other extreme. There's always litigation when you end up here. And we have the, 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 the blue line is litigation threshold and the disclosure threshold is the tau, uh, is the black line. And this, this goes into, into this. So, so increasing the cost, which means less litigation risk, uh, I lower uh, the disclosure threshold and disclose more because once you think here is here's one, right? We, we end up here. Then this is like the disclosure region, right? So you get more disclosure, the lower the, the black line is. And this is all non-disclosure here, right? Okay. So, so this is how things work. So essentially what we get, uh, we have the more litigation, which goes like here, the less disclosure we have. We, we only disclose good things. And the reason is that uh, because uh, the investors know they have this insurance, so they get money back. So they pay a higher price because it's easy for them to litigate, right? So there's a high expected value of litigation, uh, uh, damage compensation. So they increase the price, which leads to less disclosure. So we have less disclosure, the more litigation risk we have, which is right the, the 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 inverse from what what most of the the uh, empirical papers start start with all right so we do a lot of uh, sort of testable predictions i i I'm conscious of time and I, i'm too much too long anyway so just just uh, I, I just run through over that so one can do ex ante litigation risk one can do price efficiency one can do likelihood that, P, that the entrepreneur was informed you get this kind of uh, neat uh, hump shaped uh, kind of stuff in here uh, one can do it as a panel this entrepreneur one can do welfare effects and entrepreneurs innovation uh, because uh, that's what you could expect from selling the firm later on that, that pushes whether you want to invest more into getting new projects or not and so what the, this last example for example which is something we, we wouldn't probably get a, a get get to uh, once we we really just looked at uh, and and made sort of uh, casual inf inference of what what we what we could figure out but in the, in the middle it's 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 worse right so so do so, so there's uh, it's it's better to have uh, really of no no litigation or or very little and so so these are the kind of things that that one can figure out so i'm um, i'm sorry i've i've talked much too long uh, but now it's discussion time anyway thank you thank you alfred love love the button towards the end okay so um Yes, that was very uh, insightful. And um, so now we're going to uh, take over and, and have some questions. So as you know, you're sending questions um, to prep for the session. And I have them written down here. And Alfred has them as well. And so we decided to structure them a little bit. And the idea would be to start with questions that more or less directly relate to the uh, Chantelet-Wagenhofer working paper that Alfred just talked about. And then 
we will move over to um, some more broader questions uh, that will also sometimes be tricky to answer for Alfred because this was more questions. Well, can theory speak to, and then dot, 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 my favorite topic of choice. Yeah, so relatively broad. And then we will have a last round of questions that are more related to what, what I labeled meta questions. So meta questions would be questions that, that try to understand Well, what is the role of theory, generally speaking, in, let's say, in, in, in generating scientific insights? And how does this balance with empirics? So something that also Alfred uh, alluded to in the beginning of his talk. Okay, so let's start this off. And uh, the first question going to be asked by Bianca Minov. Bianca, unmute yourself and fire away, please. Yeah. And of course, you can say briefly who you are if you want, but you don't have to. Okay, yeah, I will. So, yeah, first of all, thank you very much for the presentation. So a lot of insights. Um, and yeah, I'm Bianca Minut. I'm a first year PhD student at ESCP Business School. And my question is directly related to the litigation risk on disclosure, which you just explained. So with regard to the impact of the litigation risk on disclosure in your paper with Stefan Chantel in 2021, which you just showed, you show that litigation or low litigation risk firms disclose more information in response to an increase in litigation risk. And also the other way around, high litigation risk firms disclose less. So I would be just curious about your opinion on would a distinction in high litigation risk firms and low litigation risk firms in the disclosure requirement result in a more accurate picture or disclosure picture for investors? All right, uh, thank you for, for this question. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, they're, they're, they're different. I, try to answer them in, in different perspectives in a sense. Uh, so, so one is like, what would be a good measure for over, uh, for over a lot of litigation or little litigation risk? And uh, what we used is this cost of litigation for the, uh, for the shareholders. Uh, on the other hand, one can use penalties uh, for the for the entrepreneur uh, because usually uh, damage compensation is paid by insurance companies. So there's not so much uh, on, on the firm itself. Uh, but uh, so so that that would be and and that would work differently. So if if the entrepreneur gets gets a higher reputation loss or a cost of of litigation, then then you would would have uh, kind of different different uh, effects. But but essentially, what what you are aiming at uh, in in the question is um, sort of more accurate picture of disclosure for investors. And this is like uh, essentially our. Um, <clears throat> Our, our stri uh, structure of uh, having the uh, price efficiency measure. Uh, so uh, the, the price efficiency measure in, in games like this one, where you have truthful disclosure or no disclosure at all, uh, is like usually the difference between the price and the fundamental. Uh, and then you can do the, the absolute amount or you can do the squared amount. And in, in, in both cases for us, uh, it, it would work that, that uh, when you have Uh, let me put that. Uh, if you have less disclosure, uh, you have less uh, less price efficiency. So, uh, and you have interestingly less disclosure once you uh, uh, you have a lot of uh, high litigation risk because they, so you, they they pay a sort of investors pay a higher price on, on non disclosure because they get back the money from from insurance essentially. So, so this is like the, the, the effect that, that works uh, for price efficiency, although one has to be careful uh, that price efficiency uh, as we measure is it is a T2. So once disclosure is made and then sort of prices adjust. So uh, if, if we get the, the, the additional information at T3, right? Then obviously things change again because then you you get more information from the actual information that's out there. So uh, we we look at the price efficiency in between, right? So and and th this will be different measures then. Okay, so I, I hope I kind of like answered your question. Yes, thank you very much. Okay. Perfect. So the next question is also a question related to the model, and this would be asked by Yasmin Hoffmann. Yasmin, please. Thank you. 
Hi, my name is Jasmin Hoffmann. I'm a, also a first year PhD student at the University of Mannheim, and I'm very much interested in analytical modeling and disclosure theory. And um, my question relates to the exogeneity of lambda. So given that you find the kind of thought revising result that regulation um, of whistleblowing directors really unintendedly could work against this objective of encouraging disclosure. Could you imagine a setting where the lambda is rather endogenous and could like vary in the level of the, or in the worst level of the withheld information X? So that for example, a lower withheld X um, could induce a greater lambda because the whistleblower is triggered through its sensation or its incentive for justice? And how would this change your results? Okay, uh, that's a very, very interesting question. And it's a typical question from a theorist, uh, because it endogeneity is kind of the, the key thing. And I always I would ask some, some similar questions, like whenever you, you do some put in something exogenously, and we, we vary that, right, uh, sort of uh, in, in, in our case, but, but I, I think, um, sort of, uh, considering land to be endogenous, to some extent, that will be very interesting. I mean, it, it's tough already how we do it. And so, uh, we, we haven't sort of really looked at that uh, before, but, but I guess, uh, as, as, you, as you mentioned that with the whistleblower, uh, my sense will be more like um, analysts, for example. So once you, you've got really bad news that's totally unexpected to the market, uh, then you, you may want to dig deeper and, and try to understand what's going on. And, and then you, you would, you would uh, sort of get, get more information, but it's, it's like, uh, and, and since you don't know the information ex ante, right? So, so you have to, to go to start with the, the price uh, upon non disclosure. So, it's not a non disclosure itself that, that, that could trigger endogenous lander, it must be the price. So, a higher price essentially um, would be something that you would expect there would be more potential, right? That there is uh, something going on that, that you want to follow up. Uh, and and I, I think analysts, maybe shareholders, would be the typical ones. So with regard to whistleblowers, and um, uh, I mean, we, we put it in there because it's like a typical assumption that whistleblowers come up with this information later on. Uh, but uh, it, one has to be careful with the model assumptions because in, in our case, the X, once the X comes out, uh, so you that doesn't tell you anything formally uh, whether the firm had the information at earlier times, right? Uh, when, when it, it could have disclosed. So usually, uh, in many cases, I, I think whistleblowers uh, are insiders who know that the firm has information and they put it to the, to the public, right? So, and, and if you have a whistleblower telling you something internally uh, from, from internal affairs, then, then you, you could assume uh, that, the, that the firm should know this information and that would trigger much more lawsuits uh, rather than only sort of the, the Bayesian updating up front. So that would be another effect of those things when, once you look at whistleblowers. If you look at analysts, for, for example, that, that's probably not uh, more, more like in, in the sense of our model, right? Uh, I mean, there, there, there is the, 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 the DIE model, the 2017 one, I, I quoted in, in one of the slides, um, that would assume that once uh, the, so the fact finder finds this information later on and would, would know whether the firm had it or not or didn't have it, right? And, and that, would, that would change the structure of the, of the results to some extent, because then, then you, you're sure that you win once you know that the firm had the information, so it's easy to, to sue, right? Um, so that would change the, the structure, but but essentially, I mean, thinking about land, getting land endogenous is kind of a neat a neat extension, right? Thank you. Okay, perfect. So now we have a question by Morab Sohail, and he or she asked me to read the question for him or her, um, and I will do this happily. So and also use the opportunity to link this a little bit with another question that we had in the chat, both because both questions are related to the timing of uh, information arrival and also, you know, the information arrival that, that happens at a later stage. And now um, the, the question is, how does this change? So if the, if the information arrives at a later stage compared to an earlier stage, how does this change, let's say, the model dynamics? Can you say anything about this? Um, well, uh... The, it's, it's a very generic structure, right? And, and the problem, I mean, uh, once you, you say uh, at T1, the firm doesn't have the information, so it, it, it gets it later. 
uh, then the question is, it, it could, there's no decision to make, right? So, uh, so shareholders would, would price with the exam price, which is fine. And then they would need to figure out, and this is goes into like more dynamics of disclosure, uh, whether you would expect the firm to have information more likely uh, once it comes, it is a little bit later in time, right? And then you might, uh, you, you, you would become more uh, sort of uh, skeptical uh, but but only you know so, so as long as, as no firm discloses anything uh, you you don't get any information right so so we we, we need to start with with some disclo disclosure event because otherwise there's there's nothing happening up front right mm -hmm. so th th you know so so it, it it's not not really you know uh, and so one thing that I was only also thinking about in that regard is I think in, in real life, when you think about a real life setting, so we also had questions from people, how, how can this be a real life setting that the firm doesn't, that there is important information and the firm doesn't have it. So, so and then mm -hmm. the, the example that I always give to students is think about a firm that is doing something very innovative and, and you don't simply cannot, the firm cannot observe for example, future outcomes, but other firms that are doing something that is not as innovative, they have this information about future outcomes. And now, could you think about maybe a, a refined model where firms learn over time? So there is a likelihood that firms get informed over time and, and, and they have to disclose early. So, you know, as soon as they learn, they have to disclose, but they can delay. And if they delay, they make themselves liable. Something, you know, I was thinking about something like this could something like this be going on or could this be modeled even well i i, I guess one uh, i mean that there's 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 a couple of, of papers to try to to look at more into dynamics and and the longer you wait you would expect they have to have something right so you know about innovation and your r d or whatever and you you come up with a new vac vaccine or whatever but but you don't know yet right so it's still in you know under under test uh, so 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 people have expectations about when you would be able to disclose something and there you have this kind of other risk that you disclose maybe too early and then it's wrong uh, this is the uh, the other the chilling effect uh, kind of uh, structure uh, which is also kind of interesting uh, but but that would not be work with with this model because you you could you could play around with with, with other things but in terms of innovation uh, you you have this kind of oh it works right and then it changes your 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 expectations and then you say oh should i disclose it or not right but that that would actually start and trigger the t1 here in in, in this model so then you make a decision to disclose or people expect that firms at this stage would have information and they should would disclose if the information was good and that was would, would trigger this the skeptical beliefs right so so the longer you wait the more skeptical people would would, would get Perfect. So Bianca Minov had a follow-up question also related to the whistleblower idea that you outlined in the paper. Bianca, over to you. Yeah, staying a bit with the whistleblower regulation. So in the paper, you also specify that for high regulation risk firms, the regulation sometimes lead to less instead of more disclosure. So what do you think how far a reformation of the whistleblower regulation can lead to greater investor pr protection. Um, <clears throat> I mean, in, indeed, no? uh, the in increasing the land or and things like that uh, str strengthen with, with stronger whistleblower protection. You you get higher higher lander, right? That that's sort of the the idea. And this is also what the whistleblower regulation in the European Union, the 2019 was a regulation. And in the US, the Dodd Frank Act uh, actually did uh, sort of similar thing. Uh, with the Dodd Frank Act, uh, this is uh, in parentheses uh, because it's not in the model. Uh, but uh, what what happened that uh, the SEC got overwhelmed uh, with whistleblowing stuff. They they had a, they have an office of the whistleblower, and they have so many complaints and so so much information they can't follow up. Right. So that that would be another way of uh, saying, oh, this this may be too much uh, freedom uh, for for them and then pushing for them but essentially i mean uh the the, the point here is uh if, if you have more information out there then then you get less disclosure up front right uh and then people expect the litigation to happen so so the, the, the equilibrium kind of um 
uh, goes goes into that and 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 I think it's it's very very difficult uh, to really uh, do uh, talk much about uh, sort of what's what's good and bad regulation because there's so many effects uh, that one needs to uh, consider. In our case, uh, in in this kind of model, uh, as I said, I mean, uh, if if investors are pretty sure that they get a lot of compensation later on which is with the high lander they they expect more litigation they expect more litigation and more more benefits out of that they pay higher price upon non disclosure because of the insurance effect right mm -hmm. so that actually reduces disclosure as, as as you mentioned right um so so in this sense in this narrow sense uh this regulation would not be used not be useful but only as i said before for the price at t2 right so once you add uh, the the t is equal free uh revelation of the information and this comes with whistleblowing as well then you get more information in total right so the question essentially then boils down to do you believe that um, the entrepreneur, I mean, in our case, the entrepreneur actually sells the firm, right? So, so there's a clear short term incentive to, uh, on the price, right? So once you say this is an ongoing firm, uh, then it's not that clear whether you, you just, uh, so, so what, what's the weight between short term and long term uh, incentives for the firm? So if it's long term, then whistleblowing actually helps because it, it uncovers sort of more information. Uh, in this regard, it will be good. In, in the short term, it's, it's, it's not good if you have a lot of litigation possibilities. Okay. Oh, this is interesting, also related, because there, in, in the end, it means that there is a little of this trade-off question whether you want to have quick information, let's say, by the disclosure, or whether long-term information via litigation slash you know, whistleblowing mm -hmm. is equivalent. Yeah. So. Um, Perfect. Good. I would like to move on to the second field, if this is okay. And that was the broader field. Can disclosure speak to my topic of choice? And I was trying to hunt on Caro uh, uh, Waltz here. But I think I saw her around, but I think now she left, but most likely for technical reasons. This gives me the opportunity to rephrase her quest, uh, question mildly to make it a little bit more open. So Caro uh, was interested in the uh, role that disclosure theory can play in explaining or discussing problems related to CSR disclosure. And, and I think more broadly understood, uh, you, we could think about is CSR disclosure a topic where we would expect unraveling to work or can you foresee theoretical reasons why maybe CSR disclosure is, or CSR activities are so unique or complex that maybe unraveling can also fail? So what are the, so can CSR reporting be the X of a typical unraveling model? Uh, I guess yes. I mean, it's 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 information. It's uh, relevant for a particular group of stakeholders, and this is also the problem with with all this ESG stuff at the moment because there's so many stakeholders, and this also goes into materiality issues where it's totally unclear what is a material information that would drive sort of decisions made by particular stakeholders. But as long as you assume that there is some pressure group uh, that is particularly interested in one of those many uh, uh, key, key performance indicators, uh, then uh, the whole unraveling works uh, the same way. Uh, maybe uh, the, the, the only thing is that the priors are maybe less, less known. So you know less about what, what would be costs and benefits of those, but then you look at the peer kind of thing. And then many people just compare peer groups uh, and whether they disclose particular sort of ESG measures. And then once a few people disclose, then the pressure on the others gets much stronger. And this is exactly what every uh, reveling the unraveling does. Okay. Yes. So thank you for that. I, I, might, I might be follow up in a second, but in the meantime, we have Jonas Bessel. Um, uh, Jonas, I think you are here. Jonas, can yes. you also have a related question to uh, ESG information? Would you like to ask a question? Yeah, sure. Um, so I have the question, can pressure from investors to disclose, for example, ESG information, uh, like carbon disclosure um, or ga carbon gas emissions, result in a firm in the same industry disclosing these information as well? Um, because I have the or I have an example. There's a hedge fund who pressured Airbus to disclose disclose their carbon gas emissions. So I was thinking maybe this could result in Boeing, for, for example, as well, shifting their disclosure. Mm -hmm. um, the, the simple answer is yes, absolutely. This, this is how it works. Uh, so the unraveling 
really goes on with those things, particularly if you know that a, a sort of a peer firm actually has the information. I mean, usually uh, you might be uncertain about uh, possess possessing the information, but carbon disclosure, I mean, this is just a measurement uh, and the cost of measurement problem, but not that you, you know, you, you don't uh, emit uh, carbon emissions, things like that. So, so there is something there. And then, uh, so if one firm uh, discloses that, then you know that the cost can't be that high so the other and then the pressure pressure would, would start and this is exactly what's 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 going on in, in in this regard so it introduces the skeptical beliefs and once skeptical beliefs then this this generates this kind of uh, dynamic uh, to to come up with those things yeah but it's it's still a voluntary disclosure discussion right so uh i mean this doesn't help that much with with mandatory esg kind of stuff that's that's yeah. another right Mm -hmm. Maybe just adding on this. So, uh, Ulrich, I'm not sure whether you're really quick with the mic because I didn't uh, inform you that you would be next. But you had a question about the uh, ISB and uh, um, discussion around the sustainability reporting. So, um, are you around? Yeah. Perfect. Hi, my name is Ulrich Katz. I'm a first year PhD at New York University. Nice to meet you. Um, yeah, so I had sort of a general question on... So, I, I guess my... I should preface this with, um, am I correct in assuming that your, your model, uh, Professor Ranghofer, relates to financial information in the first instance or also non-financial? Um, it, it is definitely financial because we look at investors and you, you and the price of the firm that, that uh, the entrepreneur I mean, sells the firm. So the story is, is on that. But, but as, as, as we talked about, so it's, it's, you, you can sort of do similar things uh, as long as you have the base ingredients with you, right? So there's good and bad and there is some group that will be interested and, and does and makes some decision that feeds back in terms of uh, reputation or market pricing or whatever to the firm or co co consumer right uh, dependence or financing so, so as long as there is this feedback loop right that will, whatever this group thinks and not just uh, writing articles and, and being uh, you know uh, but but really have, having an impact on, 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 on the firm essentially then then the same same structure seems to work. Yeah, because we've seen a few high profile cases where um, climate change litigation happened, for example, the ExxonMobil case in New York City, which was accused allegedly to misrepresent or cost and risk of greenhouse gas emissions. And I was thinking, so the IFRS have this consultation period where they're thinking about sustainability reporting, non-financial. And I was wondering if you think this will change perhaps these litigation risks in the future, because there's more of a standard now behind it. All right. Um, just last week, they, there was this, this uh, proposal for amendments to the constitution of the ISP. As, as you probably have seen, that the, the new standard will be called International Sustainability Standards Board and things like that. Uh, so so they, they are really pushing hard uh, to come up with something. And this is more like, as a standard set, as a global standard setter, this is really the, the question to, to come up with convergent measures so that people measure the same phenomena in, in, in the same way and not in one of the other 200 uh, plus, uh, you know, uh, frameworks uh, way. Uh, but in terms of regulation and, and litigation, the question is uh, whether there is legislation that's in place that requires you to, to, to provide some information or punishes uh, environmental damage it, itself, which is probably was the case there, right? Uh, but uh, so, so what the European Union, for example, does is, is um, they, they also put the, the CRS, CSRD directive uh, proposal out there also last week, I think. And uh, that, that will, would really push for required disclosure uh, of um, sustainability measures. And then you have a direct uh, sort of uh, instrument for, for litigation, because if they didn't disclose or did disclose wrongly, then there will be direct litigation. Otherwise, you have to come up with, with some, some other sort of, of information or, or a way to, 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 to make your case uh, before court, right? So, so potential damage would, would work like that. So, so, so in a sense, I, I think it's more like uh, getting more more sense, as, as, as you mentioned, on um, how to measure that and, and uh, people be, people see, oh, this is possible to measure and then we have a look at that. And this triggers disclosure in the first place, but also triggers um, sort of mandatory disclosure and also litigation then uh, after a while, right? 
Thank you. Interesting, interesting, I have to say. <clears throat> and one thing that I was also thinking about when I was thinking about this topic is the question of um, these bounded distributions that we normally have in unraveling models so that there is a bound, right? So whatever there is, there can, there's no firm that is worse than and a firm and this bounded um, end of, and of the distribution is known. And I was always thinking about in CSR, where we, maybe if we don't have this bound. There's always a firm that can even be worse uh, in terms of uh, CSR behavior. And maybe this, I'm, I'm always a little bit concerned what this does to unraveling if you're not sure that you are the last one. <laughs> uh, normally it wouldn't do much. Uh, so I think the, the old Varekia stuff uh, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't have a boundary. Uh, so, so it's just normal distribution uh, thing. So, so you end up with somewhere in the nowhere minus infinity. Uh, so it, it, it only matters essentially for the, the real full unraveling mm. for everything, right? So once you have cost or some, some other friction and sure. most models have other frictions, then you end up with, a, with an interval and, and then the, the lower bound doesn't matter anymore. So yeah, yeah, yeah. In, the, in the lower interval, you always have the pooling anyhow. So yeah. Yeah. okay, okay, thanks. So now we would move on to another topic that people found interesting, and that's social media disclosure. And and Rusha, I think you you are going first with your cap with your question. Rusha, please. Hi, hi everyone. Hi, Alfred. So I am a first year PhD student at NHH Norway. And my question here relates to social media uh, uh, disclosures. So, so basically, uh, the, in the accounting literature, the recent accounting literature, it explores the influence of social media communication on invested decisions. And it also highlights the herding behavior of investors based on the opinions of some so-called influences on social media who may be analysts, who may be firm management executives. So my question is, whom, as per your opinion, are better influences? Do investors tend to believe analysts' uh, opinion on the social media more, or are firm disclosures or firm management executive disclosures more reliable for investors? All right. Th thank you for, for this, this interesting question about social media, uh, because social media is really sort of an exciting area to, to come up. And there's, there's not much theory on that, uh, to, to be sure. So, so whatever I, I'm talking now is, is like my, my opinion of you on, on those things to some extent. And uh, I, I guess to answer the question, who, who is the better influencer, uh, one needs to be sure uh, what what are the objectives uh, of those those people? Why what, what are incentives of doing that? Uh, one needs to make sure or be clear that uh, whenever the firm publishes information, it can get sued. So it's it's not like oh this is my opinion about something you know and then this is cheap talk. So it's not cheap talk by the firm because they they need to uh, I mean they're bound by by legal requirements uh, what what they can disclose and what they, they cannot uh, disclose. So that makes that makes a difference particularly. I guess in social media, and uh, one other thing is uh, who who believes in what? How credible are disclosures? So, given the firm this uh, sort of put, get, gets in there and and provides information that would be cre more credible than of most other people probably, and uh, so so that makes makes a kind of difference. And and the and the, the other question then is like. Uh, who um, who answers? Who responds to that? And who who you want to influence? And why why would you know why would that that matter in any any way for for that? And so there's a, a, a lot of stuff uh, I, I've seen with communication with customers. Obviously uh, now now times in investors and uh, one you know uh, <clears throat> gets gets in this this kind of uh, herding kind of thing. And then um, uh, Joachim's uh, one. Uh, example with the theory part in the video was was about so social media right and so so that's that's kind of like uh, interesting uh, what would be are, are these people rational are they just driven by something uh, uh gamification kind of stuff with with the uh with the reddit uh, stuff you know um have you seen with with uh uh, <clears throat> the thing with GameStop, for example, you know, so so th then then rational arguments wouldn't help anymore. So it's more like um, 
hurting or you know believing or, or just playing right so so we want to get rid of, of sort of one of those those big short, short sellers kind of thing and and so 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 it's it's i i think it's extremely hard to uh, to, to figure out uh what group of people is are the players there? Uh, what's their incentives, as I said? What's their information set? Uh, what, what's the true beliefs or not? And and, and why they, why why would they do that? And and we also can't. Ex, ex, I mean, they can be overconfidence. It can be all, all sorts of things. And and I guess uh, theory would require you to make a sort of uh, a decision what kind of type you look at. And there may be two different types or three different types and they play with each other and then figure out what's going on. And you can get hurting, uh, or, you know, or uh, beauty contests and whatever, uh, also with rational uh, players in, 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 in these bubble setups, right? And social media is, is like uh, pushing that to some extent, but, but very often the, the, the real question is, um, why would you believe anybody? Except for the firms, I guess, because they can get get sued for, for for wrong wrong information. So so I I can't answer that actually. So yeah, from from a modeling side, as I said, one, one needs to be much more clear what what you're really aiming at and what what what's your construct uh, to or the lens that you look at uh, those social media information and 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 discussions. Maybe maybe also a very interesting topic for descriptive work to begin with. So mm -hmm. starting with. With Alfred's remarks about sometimes you need descriptive work in from an empirical side first to understand maybe the incentives of these players better, and then you can actually derive some theoretical predictions based on that, and then we can take it to causal inference. Yeah, so it's a real long research program that we have in front of us here. So um, there are a bunch of other questions uh, by Rebecca Cupridge that basically boil down to the one statement that I try to lure you uh, with is. Uh, social media and uncertain investor response is social media finance talk an attempt to level the field on sophistication level of investors or manipulation? <laughs> That's an opinion question, Alfred. So, <laughs> um, I, I, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I, I thought what, what I would answer there, <laughs> except for an opinion or besides an opinion. Uh, so, uh, I mean, what, one kind of interesting thing is uh, suppose they, if, if these are sophisticated, sophisticated uh, investors and things like that, right? not, not just, you know, some, something else, uh, then, then there's really sort of uh, price bubbles that could happen. And, and you, you mentioned the herding and I don't want to explain herding uh, here, but, but maybe the, the Keynes beauty contest, I'm not sure whether everybody understands understands that or knows that and this, because it really ties back to the to the unraveling uh, to some extent and so so let me let me give like uh, two minutes uh, be against beauty contest which is a very old thing uh, <clears throat> it's rational agents in the stock market okay and the idea is like look at the fictional london newspaper contest participants uh, choose six most at attractive faces from a hundred photographs so 100 photographs and you have to choose the uh, six most attractive ones. And um, those people who pick the most popular faces are eligible for a prize. So you need to pick those faces or the face that, that really is, is, the, is the, most people pick, right? In a sense, this is like stock market, right? And <clears throat> and so so once you start thinking about this, then then obviously uh, one way would be you look for the, for the prettiest you, you like most. But then in, in a second thought is like, hey, I'm, am, am I kind of the, the average person that you, you want to have there? So wouldn't I have to rather go for what I believe other agents find like the most attractive photo? Uh, and then you, you even go around and said, um, hmm, uh, if, if they do the second step, would I have to do a third step? What other agents think that the majority of the others think, that the majority of the others think. And you, you see what I mean? This is like the, the, the same unraveling uh, story in a sense. So uh, it's, it's like a, a gaming structure uh, where uh, you, you find bubbles, you find all sorts of uh, things. And, and, and for example, there's an interesting paper by Ping Yang Gao, I, I think it was Char in 2008 or so uh, with this uh, Keynes Beauty Contest and why would public information matter and he finds that public information uh, really helps uh, to to focus this this kind of equilibrium a little bit better than just leaving it go let, letting it go right so so public information in this sense um so 
well, you know, as a firm, you 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 come in and say, oh, it, it works differently or whatever, right? Uh, that that would actually be a good thing in 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 bubbles like like that. So I'm not sure whether that answers anything here, but. But it's, I, I also like, I'm a big fan of the Keynes Beauty Contest. So it was good to talk about it. And I think it's there is some truth to it. Uh, I think this is certainly going on, not only in the stock market, but maybe also in, in you know, social media, also disclosure choice. So what do I communicate? Do I, have, I think, do I communicate what I find interesting or whatever, what I believe that other people find interesting and how does this converge, right? So very, very insightful. So we are already quite ahead of time. So... Um, I think what I would like to do, so next up is Ariana Pichella. She has some questions. She also raised a very interesting question in the chat that I also have an opinion to, but Ariana, please go and ask whatever you want to ask. I will make it short. And then um, Ulrich would be then next, and then Dominic would be closing the session with your questions. Okay, perfect. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot also for the presentation and discussion. Uh, so yes, I, I will maybe summarize my my main question. So one is about the meaning of strategic disclosure. If it's in, more, in very general terms, do we um, refer to strategic disclosure only in a negative connotation, like greenwashing or impression management, or can also be a good uh, practice? Uh, so to choose really the... Um, um, the good news in a, to achieve a sort of good strategic outcomes. Uh, so th this is the first one. Then the second is about the materiality. Uh, if we should assess materiality um, we, only with respect to the st target stakeholders or are there any other um, criteria that you can suggest to, to address materiality? And then, yes, the last one that uh, just raised, uh, I raised it in the chat, is about the descriptive studies. Uh, because I, as far as I know, like many editors and many reviewers uh, tend to reject these kind of studies. So I would like to know what suggestions can you give us in order to publish these descriptive studies and maybe which are the target journals that we should, uh, we should address to. Thank mm -hmm. you. All right. Okay. So uh, let me briefly go to the to the first uh, question about strategic disclosure. So I, I understand that uh, many many cases you you would say strategic disclosure is like a bad thing uh, because people exploit others and may may use it to the, their own advantage against the others. Uh, so, so in that sense, that's uh, that's a, a typical thing. I mean, impression management is, could could sound good as well. It's it's, but it's here it's bad as well. So, uh, in in the typical uh, thing, and greenwashing is all not green in sense. So, uh, I mean, in 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 game theory, uh, strategic decisions is like you you try to make use of all the information you have and conjectures that you have, and and that, and that's what all the others do as well. So everybody's on the same page and on the same level. So it's not exploit of somebody else uh, so it's it's more more neutral in, in game theory terms because a strategy is like something you make a decision based on some kind of information right so that's that's totally neutral uh, but um, as I said, I mean, very often in in, uh, in, in normal talk, uh, strate being strategic is like you you want to exploit others and, and and work to your own advantage. So, uh, agreed with that. With that, uh, the, the the materiality question that that's a really sort of fundamental question in a sense. Uh, I mean, I'm I'm sure you you looked at materiality definitions in the IFRS framework, and uh, uh, there's lot, there's a practice statement uh, from IFRS about making materiality materiality judgments when that's all financial information so uh it's 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 like uh it, briefly right so so any, you, any information that that might change decisions by by the, the the receivers of that information is is material right and the question is how much should it change and things like that and it gets really more more of a problem once you go to ESG disclosures because then you probably don't even know what the others would do with that information that much. So so it's totally unclear and 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 one for, for, for one group uh, some some kind of information is totally useless for others it's it's absolutely relevant but it's a small group it's a big group so so as a firm 
and and you you were talking about litigation in, in you know i i have no clue what 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 to do with that so so once you you push it over to to more general disclosures of of, of different kinds of information for different recipients uh it's an extremely difficult question and uh i mean there's a lot of court rulings in particular in the us about uh, materiality but but it's it's uh, you 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 can't even write a good rule i mean it's a principle in a sense disclose everything that you think is like important for people and their react on that so uh, there's no help and 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 there's almost no formal modeling of that because it's so hard to do because you can always construct something where sort of even a tiny piece of information makes a big change in 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 a, in, a, in an assum- in in sort of a decision right so so if if it continues right and you it, it jumps at 0.5 right and you have 0.49 or you know uh, you know then, then 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 those things change so that's very hard uh in terms of your, your third question, uh, I, I what I said is I like descriptive work and I'm a theorist, right? So <laughs> this doesn't mean that empiricists uh, like uh, descriptive work. I mean, there are a couple of uh, descriptive stuff uh, I recall, like uh, there was once uh, a a paper uh, that 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 got really extremely cited, uh, much cited about uh, sort of uh, financial uh, CFOs. Uh, telling they do earnings management, things like that, right? So this was a JE article uh, once, uh, and and that got really extremely many quotes uh, because it's it's important to to I mean that that people say they do this, right? And so so this is like a, a good thing. And on the other hand, in most most cases, I I would sense it it's it's nice to to have descriptive stuff up front, and then as I say, I, I, my ideal would be then trying to come up with you you see some patterns. And then you try to make sense of that and then come up with theory and then you you do sort of real real tests uh deductive uh research in in this regard so i agree it's 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 very hard to publish uh, descriptive stuff uh, these days so i mean once you go into uh, lower level journals uh, they will be easier uh but but if you have a fancy setting uh which no one has has looked at or so th- things like that right then it might be might be interesting, but but this is definitely a question. Joachim knows much more about empiricals and and their bad reviewers have it. I will come up with a smart answer for wrapping up. Um, and and in the meantime, Dominic is uh, um, having the honor and the obligation to ask the last question, and we're moving to the meta question. So this is also very very much related to uh, the last point that we discussed. Dominic, please. All right. Hi, I'm Dominic from the University of Würzburg. I'm a first year PhD student. And um, I think the first question I had, you already answered in your um, presentation, because I was interested in the relation between empirical and theoretical research. But I think you answered, answered that quite well. So thank you for that. Um, I have a more like yeah, meta question, because it's always demanded that there should be evidence-based decisions by politicians and so on. and Mm, do you think, or which one do you see? Think is more important, important the theoretical or the empirical part? Because often it, it is said that okay, there's no empirical evidence for it, so we can't uh, make this or that law because yeah, there's no evidence. But I mean, do you think they go hand in hand, or yeah, I'm just interested in your opinion there. Thank you. Well, that, that's a, that's a very important question. Essentially, I'm I'm with the standard setter as well, and uh, the Austrian standard setters, but also with, with this ISP stuff. So involved all this time, and uh, with Ifrek uh, like Joachim, uh, and they and and they they always ask the the uh, researchers uh, help us uh, make uh, decisions on what whether we should do this or go move forward in this regard or that regard, and uh, my personal view is that they really mostly actually like descriptive stuff, which is very surprising to me. I mean, I, I don't know whether, whether you find that, that different, Jorim, but but that's that's my impression, uh, because that's something that's that they can follow up and they can say, oh, this is what really people did or told, you know, uh, whenever you come up with fancy stuff, uh, you know, it's like uh, econometrics that that really, you know, fancy, uh, then they they just don't understand it, and so so they they are hesitant to believe it if 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 there's something that they don't fully understand or you know, uh, and with theory it's also hard for them to to really understand that, and and if you do the the sort of simple theory, say oh it's it's clear anyway, given you you told me that, then you know. 
so so my my sense is uh, that they like empirical stuff more uh, but but they are not really well trained i guess to appreciate uh, really causal carefully causal studies and things like that so all those those fancy things right this is very hard to for them to digest typically but but i think they're on a good learning curve and they talk a lot to to researchers and so hopefully i guess they um, that those things will will jump in but but the other problem there is you always find a study that shows something different right and then they come up and say oh so so what what, what should we do now right and then in, in in the end it's all a political decision so well thank you maybe maybe to add one or two points to this uh, so the first the first thing about descriptive studies I just um, uh, copy and pasted the Graham and al study that Alfred talked about into the chat. Um, but I would I also, and I apologize for the for the link. It looks ugly. Um, uh, but I would also like to mention that I think the appetite for good descriptive studies in uh, leading journals has increased significantly over the last year. For example, years. For example, when you look at JAR, and you take a careful look at the last issues, you will see a bunch of uh, descriptive papers that are published in JAR. So to some extent, this is. Um, side effect, and I believe a very positive side effect from be becoming more critical about identification. So now uh, researchers have to take a stand whether they really believe that their evidence can be interpreted in a causal way, or whether they rather uh, try to market it as interesting associations that other people can sort out, whether it is really it is really a causal or maybe something else. And, and I, I think there is an appetite for papers that show us something that we about reality that we don't know yet. And whether then the, let's say, theoretical explanations that Alfred and his peers come up with are empirically descriptive, this is maybe then something to test maybe in the lab even first and then take to the field uh, and, and see whether it also holds in the field and whether it is so prominent as an effect that it really matters also in the, let's say, in the war, in the wide cross section, right? So this is um, what Alfred alluded to as first and second order, whether this is really an important effect, a large effect. You know, this is something that we can only test in the field. But to me, this all goes hand in hand. And also about Dominic's question about whether we, whether we should advise politicians based on theory, based on evidence, so empirical evidence, or on both. I think ideally on both. So a, a good theory paper, if explained well, and I think this is really challenging, but if explained well, can, can increase the understanding of, of you know, mechanisms within the standard setter, for example, within the regulator. I will never forget when we had a session with Hans Hogerforst, then the uh, head of the ISB. And uh, in this session, I think Hans understood this notion of contracting and conservatism for the first time. So, and it was really, you could literally see how um, he thought about this. Oh yeah, this makes sense. Okay, now I understand why sometimes bias reporting might be good. And again, and, and just understanding these mechanisms um, that theorists you know, pinpoint can help you to, to get a feeling about you know, whether this is important or not really in the field, whether it matters in the field, whether subjects really behave according to these predictions, this is where empirics are important, right? So you can come up with theories for almost everything. You have to see whether this is also descriptive or powerful enough to describe real life behavior. And I think this is where, you know, us empiricists are, are in need. And in the end, and I think that is Alfred also spot on, don't underestimate the importance to communicate all this in plain English, because if this is not being understood by the recipient, then no matter what we as scientists do, it will never have impact because simply people don't understand us. So communication is important. So that will be my last two cents on this. Alfred, anything to add? It's your session. No, thanks. I think you made it very clear and I agree. Okay. So, so everybody apologize for running a little bit over time. It's entirely my fault. Um, thank you all that stuck around and, and asked questions. I think that was highly insightful. So um, Wednesday, for those of you that take credits, we have the Q&A, 8.30 uh, in the morning. 
Central European summertime. And for the others, you can relax for two weeks and then, or not, not just a good week, because then we have new videos. And then in two weeks, we're going to have a new discussion session. Then with Anna Bayer from Stanford. If you have any questions or remarks, to, if you want to have further discussions, use YouTube or GitHub issues. Yeah, floor is yours. It was great to have you guys around. Thanks, Alfred, for doing this. Again, it was highly insightful, very um, informative. And everybody, have a great day, evening, or night, or morning, or whatsoever, wherever you are. Cheers. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks. Thank you.